Our next guest uh, lives in Los Angeles. Uh, her YouTube channel has over a quarter million people who subscribe to it. Many of you have asked her to come and be a part of Convocation because you really resonate uh, with her journey and some of her struggles. And so we're excited that she gets to be a part of this. Come on, put your hands together, everybody, for Jessica McCabe. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> There's so many of you. How to be unsuccessful in college. That is not a typo, which I do sometimes make because I was unsuccessful in college. I was invited to come speak with you today, but no one actually specified what I was supposed to speak to you about or even what I should avoid. So as a leading expert in the matter, I'm going to explain to you how to be unsuccessful in college. Assuming no one comes up here and stops me. I'll speak quickly. One, don't admit you need help. When I was in college, I was a couple weeks into a statistics course before I realized I'd forgotten to sign up for it, and now it was too late. Luckily, the professor was really cool and told me I could still take it, and whatever grade I got, he would give it to me the next semester. I just had to register. It was a tough course, but I worked really hard and I aced it. Right, here's the thing. I also forgot to register the next semester, which was super embarrassing and I felt like an idiot. So I just avoided said professor out of shame, like didn't go into that building, which would have worked well, but years later I happened to run into him. Awkward. Ever hopeful, I asked if I could still register and get that A I had worked so hard for. And that answer was, no, it's been three years. Why didn't you come to me sooner? I could have helped you out. So if you want to be unsuccessful in college, don't talk to your professors. In fact, don't ask for any help at all. Be afraid. Be embarrassed. Assume the worst. Hide out. Ideally, disappear completely. <laughs> if anyone asks how you're doing when you're hiding in the bushes, tell them you're doing fine. That way, no one ever knows you need help. So you never get it. Two, don't take breaks. Don't make time for friends, or food, or sleep. This is a wonderful way to burn yourself out, so eventually you'll be passed out on the floor, unable to get anything done. <laughs> it's the law of diminishing returns, and you don't want to break the law. <laughs> Recharging, allowing your brain to process what you've learned? <laughs> no. If you're struggling, try harder. Never stop working. Alternatively, never stop playing video games. This is even more effective because it goes straight to the not getting anything done. Do lots of things that have nothing to do with your goals. I majored in English, so I took ballet, and fencing, and theater, and taekwondo. Yeah, which was fun, right? Awesome classes. Um, I needed the credits, it was fun to explore new things. But then I took opera, and Italian, so I could understand what I was singing in opera. And music business, because my boyfriend was a musician and I wanted to help him with that. In my extensive experience, the more subjects you take that have nothing to do with getting your degree, the less progress you'll make, and the less likely it is that you'll actually graduate and leave behind all that wonderful cafeteria food. Finally, drop out. <laughs> really, this is the one that matters. You can tell your parents I said this. 100% guaranteed, drop out, you fail. Trust me, I know, I aced statistics. The other tips just help you get to the point where you're failing and discouraged enough that you can rationalize total surrender, which I did. I dropped out because in my mind, it made sense for me to drop out. Remember, I was spending a lot of time on the floor. And while I wasn't making any real progress toward my degree, I was making real progress as an actress. My theater teacher had introduced me to his acting manager. I was getting auditions, I'd booked a couple of roles, so I made what I felt was a fairly reasonable decision to pursue something I might be more successful at. Besides, I could always come back to college. This is my first time on a college campus in 15 years. I didn't go back to college, and I wasn't any more successful as an actress or in life. I ran into the same challenges I'd had in college. I struggled with relationships and time management. I quit or was fired from 15 jobs. And like in college, my response to these failures was always the same, try harder, which I did with questionable results. <laughs> Meanwhile, I spent my nights waiting tables, serving people who did finish college, 
who really were successful, was, which was both inspiring, success was possible, and really frustrating. So why couldn't I get there? At 32 years old, I was living with my mom after my divorce, and I decided I was done putting so much effort into being unsuccessful and to redirect that effort into learning about what had been getting in my way in college, my career, life. I had one clue. I had ADHD. You too? <laughs> I'd been diagnosed as a kid, but I never thought of ADHD as that big a deal. Honestly, I laughed along with everyone else when they treated it like it was a joke. But I decided to do some research and look into it, like I did with ballet and taekwondo. Only this time I stuck with it, because what I found was eye-opening. Explanations of why people with ADHD struggle with these challenges, because apparently it wasn't just me, and strategies for dealing with them. I began using what I found to create an ADHD toolbox, and because I tend to lose things, I put it in the one place I knew I could definitely find it again, YouTube. Three years later, having talked with hundreds of ADHD experts, listened to tons of podcasts, spoken to thousands of people with ADHD, and made over 100 videos about it, I can tell you. ADHD affects a lot more than focus. It's no joke. And not understanding or dealing with my ADHD challenges played a huge part in why I was unsuccessful in college and in life. It's not an excuse, but it is an explanation, and it explains a lot. Let's revisit my mistakes. Don't ask for help. It's common for those with ADHD or any mental condition, anxiety, depression, autism, learning disabilities, to struggle in silence. A big reason for that is shame. Because it was my behavior that was the problem, I felt ashamed of my behavior, ashamed of myself, especially when I knew I could do better. Because I had done better. As everyone kept telling me, I had so much potential, I just needed to try harder. If I didn't admit that I bought the wrong book or couldn't find my homework or forgot to register for a class, again, nobody knew. So nobody teased me. Nobody called me irresponsible or a space cadet. Nobody laughed at me. I didn't have to laugh along pretending it didn't hurt. Because ADHD impairments are things everyone struggles with sometimes, and because they aren't consistent, it can be easy to dismiss them or to laugh at them. But not everyone struggles with these challenges daily to the extent that someone with ADHD does. And that inconsistency is part of the condition. ADHD can create a frustrating disconnect between potential and performance. When ADHD brains are stimulated and engaged, they do well. When they're not, they don't. Don't take breaks. There's a common misconception that people with ADHD can't pay attention. In reality, their brains have trouble regulating their attention, which means sometimes, yeah, everything distracts them, and other times, they actually can't pull themselves away. This is called hyperfocus. It's kind of a double-edged sword. It can help you get in a zone and work on writing a talk for 10 hours straight. It can also make you skip meals and sleep, which makes your symptoms worse, which makes it a lot harder to give that talk or do anything else once it's over. And it's especially problematic when you get stuck doing something that isn't even what you want to be doing. No one's goal is to spend 50 hours playing Candy Crush. Having achieved that goal, trust me, it's not that rewarding. And do things that have nothing to do with your goals. Doing everything except the thing you intended to do is actually super common with ADHD brains because their executive function system basically the part of the brain that's responsible for everything, from planning and prioritizing to shifting your attention and sustaining effort toward your goals, is impaired. And since it relies on a neurotransmitter called dopamine to function, it's especially impaired when it's not getting enough dopamine, which is usually. Because they tend to have less dopamine and fewer dopamine receptors than neurotypical brains, ADHD brains prioritize interest and stimulation, things that produce dopamine over importance, which explained why I took classes that were fun instead of the classes I needed. As much as it made sense for me at the time to blame myself and feel like a terrible person, it's really common for students with ADHD to drop out of college. 
if they even make it there. But that doesn't mean those with ADHD have to be unsuccessful in college or in life. Understanding how the ADHD brain works and how to work with it can make a huge difference. This is what I do differently now. I ask for help. Can you roll back on the slides? There. We go. Um, when I'm when I'm having trouble, I accept that there's probably a reason for it. I educate myself on what's going on and I look for strategies that can help. Studying with a friend, asking for accommodations. When I know I'm going to be in an environment that's difficult for my brain, or I'm going to be going through some big life changes and my supports are going to fall away, like they do when you go off to college, for example, I try to put those supports and accommodations in place before I need them. Think of it like putting a steering wheel in a car before you crashed into somebody. It's not for emergency situations. It's meant to be preventative so you don't have an emergency situation. I didn't used to ask for help because I knew I could do better. But now I look for supports because I know I can do better. And they help me do that. I admit when I'm struggling and I talk to people who get it. This helps with the shame too because it helps me realize I'm not alone. And I take breaks. This is the most difficult one for me still, but I do. I try to break projects down into chunks I can reasonably accomplish in one day so I can let my brain do its hyper-focused thing, which can be really effective, and I can still sleep. If I'm hyper-focused on something really interesting, I set timers. One of my mentors, Eric Tivers from ADHD Rewired, suggests throwing them across the room so you have to get up to turn them off. And I do some things that have nothing to do with my goals. Now that I understand that my brain prioritizes things that are stimulating over things that are important, I do work I'm passionate about. So my brain gets the extra stimulation that it needs to function. I set up my day so I can work on the most challenging stuff when my stimulant medication is in effect. And if my brain can't focus on one project, I just switch to another one. Sometimes I still have to do things that aren't engaging to my brain, in which case I use lots of accountability and gamification to help me stay on track. Do I stay on track? Not totally. I understand now that my brain still needs to wander, so I make space for that. As Rick Green from Totally ADD suggests, I bend the world to fit me. That can be challenging to do when you're in college and have courses you have to take. But there are some things I definitely would have been done differently if I'd known then what I know now, like take a lighter course load or ask for accommodations. Now here's what I don't do differently, not have ADHD. This might seem obvious, but there can be a lot of pressure on those of us with mental health conditions to overcome those mental health conditions, or at least manage the symptoms perfectly before we'll be acceptable. So we work really hard at it. I worked really hard at it, and I've come a long way. I learned a lot of strategies, and I've gotten really good at learning how to work with my brain. But I still struggle. All the strategies in the world don't matter if you're not using them, and part of ADHD is difficulty using them. It's easy to tell someone who's having trouble remembering to do things, to just put it on their calendar or make a list. But it's important to remember that remembering to use that calendar or making lists and then not lose them is part of the challenge because it requires executive functioning, the ability to shift focus, prioritize, organize, which is exactly what is impaired in ADHD brains. I wish I'd understood that when I was in college. I wish anyone had understood that because the truth is, I wish I'd gotten the help I needed. I'm really sad that I never got that degree. It was important to me and I still don't have one. It didn't matter that I was smart enough to get on the dean's honor roll. I still struggled. I still got discouraged. I still dropped out. I wish I'd known that being gifted didn't mean I don't need help. That simple accommodations could have leveled the playing field and given me an equal chance. And I wish I'd known that needing help was okay. That being different, having different struggles didn't make me less than, because what I'm capable of is different too. The very traits that made college and life difficult for me, my impulsivity, hyper-focus, spontaneous mind-wandering, interest-based learning, turned out to be an enormous asset in the right environment and with the right supports. There's a reason people with ADHD are three times as likely to start their own business. We take risks 
And yeah, we fail more often as we figure out how to work our unique brains in a world that wasn't built for us. But that doesn't make us failures. I have strengths and I have weaknesses, and that's true for everybody. But my challenge is don't negate my strengths. Our failures don't invalidate our successes. We all have something valuable to offer the world. We all have a purpose. And this is how I was made. And the sooner I was able to understand and embrace my brain, the sooner I was able to learn to work with it and to fulfill my purpose. Not by getting better at being normal, but by getting better at being me. If you know someone with a mental health condition or learning disability, and you want to help them succeed, tell them it's okay that their brain works differently. They might fight you on this, but they probably need to hear it. I still need to hear it sometimes. And if you're the one with a brain that works differently, let me tell you what one of my mentors told me. You are not a failed version of normal. Even if you're successfully unsuccessful in college, whatever you're struggling with, you don't need to try harder, just different. Because your brain is different, you are different, and you are capable, and you are not alone. And if you need some help remembering that, if you need like 250,000 people to remind you of that. Welcome to the tribe. Thank you so much. I have a question. Oh. I think one of the reasons that so many of our students really resonate uh, with your YouTube channel is not only because uh, a lot of them have ADHD or have a family member, but a lot of them walk into an environment like this where that's exposed, maybe even through their roommate or a friend, and they really want to not only understand but help. Uh, what is one piece of advice if God has someone in our life that um, is fearfully and wonderfully made but has mental challenges like this? How do we just walk in and begin to be a, a help to a friend? What is one piece of advice you'd give us? Learn about it, because a lot of what we assume about other people is that if they do something, that it means the same thing as if we do it. You know, if I show up five minutes late to coffee, it doesn't mean I don't care. It means that my brain had a harder time getting engaged, or maybe it, it's a coping mechanism for me to run a little bit late because then my brain turns on and it functions a little better. And so maybe I didn't plan well and I was five minutes late, but now I can be present and engaged with you. Whereas if I had gotten there early, I, my brain would have been everywhere and I would have been stressed out. So just understand that the same behavior can mean different things if it's coming from somebody whose brain works differently. And just ask. Don't assume that what you think about the other person is what's going on. Don't assume that they're lazy. Ask them if they're having trouble getting started. And Jessica, you're making a big difference and you've helped a lot of people today. Can we thank Jessica for thank just you. doing a phenomenal job? Thank you. Thanks again.